We're in our third week of a sermon series called Why Church, and uh, I wanted to recap the first couple of weeks, and that'll take us through most of the message today, <laughs> uh, and then bring a, th- a third and final point. But if you, re- if you recall, uh, uh, the answer, the, the, the way the sermon series top, uh, started was because we were thinking about the nuns in our lives, and we had been in conversation with some of them, and many, many of them said, uh, had the question, can I be a Christian and not go to church? Can I be a Christian and not go to church? And I tried to answer that with the long answer, which is what preachers do well. And I I said, uh, church was not my idea. It's, I would never think of doing this. I I would rather be a Christian alone, honestly. It's just a lot easier. But church was not my idea. Whose idea was it? It was Christ's idea. And in fact, you remember that time in in, uh, Matthew chapter 16, when when we first hear the word church, uh, and it's when, when Christ is talking to his disciples and he says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Christ says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. From now on, your name will be Peter. And on this rock, which is Petro, on this rock, I will build my church. And that's the first time we hear it. It's Jesus' idea. But that wasn't the first time the word... Uh, the word in the scripture was ecclesia, and so they knew this word ecclesia, even though there was no church, like the word church didn't exist in the Greek language. They knew this word ecclesia, and uh, ecclesia means an assembly, a gathering together, an assembly. On the rock of Peter, I will build my assembly, and I, and I, I wanted to make the case that it wasn't that we're building the church on Peter himself, but on Peter's confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah the Son of the living God. And all everywhere, everywhere, everybody everywhere who can, who can confess that and transform their life or have their lives transformed to that, to the fact that Christ is the Son of the living God and He is the Messiah. He is the one God has sent to bring redemption and salvation to us. Everyone who professes that, confesses that, and lives a life in such a way that follows that, that's the church. That's the church. So the question of whether or not can I be a Christian and go to church, I said, well, uh, you are the church. You don't go to church. If you confess Christ as you're the Son of the living God and your Messiah, you are now a part of the church. It's kind of like marriage. You can't be married alone, though I would, that sometimes that intrigues me. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. You can't do it alone, you know? It's the same with being a Christian. There's no, John Wesley says there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. It's not, it's not possible. We, and I, we are a herd, you know, a pack, a pack of wolves or a flamboyance of flamingos or a committee of vultures, and that's not the best one, or a pod of sharks, whales. I think whales are in pods. If you, if you think about what a... What a group of lions is called is called an ambush. A group of rhinos is called a crash. A group of people are called a community. And a group of Christians, an assembly of Christians, is called the church. And we showed that video about how uh, of the, uh, the water buffalo and how there, one, was, one was being attacked by a lion, remember? And the water buffalo, as a community, could defend and protect that, that, the youngest of their crew. That's what we are as a church. We offer that kind of protection. It wasn't right for us to be alone. God never intended to be alone. I remember when uh, Richard Turtle, who sang sang our Jesus Loves Me song this morning, I remember when I was in the hospital while his wife was passing away a few months ago. And he looked at on the hospital bed and then he said, that's my wife. And then he said to me, Pastor, it's not right for a man to be alone. That's in the Bible. He said that to me, and pastors don't like being told what's in the Bible. But he was right. It's always been God's intention since the first book of Genesis when he created man. He said, the man needs a partner because it's not right for us to be alone. Even before that, before the beginning of time, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit together, community, a pack, a flamboyance, a herd. God is Communal. It's not right for his creatures to be alone. That's the church. That's one aspect of the church. Just the mere fact of community to protect and encourage and support one another. 
No more loneliness. That's the church. I, had, I was preparing for my sermon on Saturday. Well, I don't want the DS to know I was preparing for it on Saturday. But I was, I was winding it up, and in the middle, uh, on, uh, uh, Andrew Bittner clicked in on Facebook, and he, start, he says, quick question, Fred. And I thought, a quick qu- I was like, okay, I'm preparing for my sermon, make it quick. 36 minutes later, you know, have you ever talked to Andrew? <laughs> 36 minutes later, we're going back and forth, and he's challenging me. He's challenging me as a, as, a, as a believer. And I'm challenging him back, and he's coming back at me, and I'm thinking, man, I would rather be at church alone. Because he keeps challenging me. And I would just like to, be, to have the church of Fred, in which I'm the pastor and also the ad council chair, <laughs> and also the custodian, and all that stuff where I don't have to be challenged by this punk 24-year-old kid who thinks he knows everything, right? But then I go back and I'm working on the sermon and I'm thinking, maybe God placed him here to sharpen me like iron sharpens iron. I mean, the church is made for protection, community, so that we're not left alone, but it's also made for correction, I mean, God placed each and every one of us here with different gifts because we have blind spots, is what Andrew told me. (laughs) We do have blind spots, and so we need each other. We need each other, and God places us here with people who love us and care for us where we can trust to hear a strong word that we need to hear. The church is often referred to as the bride of Christ, and God is making her holy and without blemish. What, wearing white. And the church is a part of that process of holiness. Together, we make, we, we enable Christ to make us holy, to transform us, to make us holy. This sermon series has really been challenging me because Last week, I talked about membership versus discipleship, that you can be a member at the YMCA, and when you're a member and you pay your fees, you can demand stuff because you're a member, and it's there to, it's there to, uh, you're there to take from it, and they're there to give, to serve you. But the church uses that word member as well, but it's getting us all confused because what the church is not made of members, it's actually made of disciples, And while membership is about taking, discipleship is all about sacrifice. And it's got us really messed up, I think, the church today, with the the small C church. Because you know that it's entirely possible to be a member of a church and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Church, small C. That's possible, isn't it? I feel like, well, I'm, when working through this sermon series, that I need to repent. Because I've, when I first got here, mine, if you were interested in joining this church, I would like, let's sign them up before they change their mind. <laughs> right? And I'd line them up here, quick read those things, you know, just answer these questions, and then we'll give you your certificate and your part, and the bishop will be happy, and we'll all be happy, right? But I've done them, I've done them a disservice. Because I've made them think that the cost of discipleship is so cheap. But it's not. Jesus says, count the cost of discipleship. If you will follow me, count the cost first. I got a call this week, and it was, uh, it was it's a hard call. I got a call from a, a, a young woman who wanted me to baptize her child. And I love baptizing kids. I want to baptize all y'all's kids. That's Texan. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I'm just looking for a way to say yes. And she says, what are the requirements? Uh, if I'm not a member of your church, will you baptize my ch- child? And I said, well, if you're not a member, what I would really like is just that you would come for three Sundays so that we can get to know you, you can get to know us, and uh, it'll, that'll make the day of baptism extra special. And I'm thinking, if we can get her here three Sundays, she ain't leaving, right? Because we're awesome. And so I'm, I'm using some, you know, persu- I'm, I'm using everything I'm learning in, as a, in, in seminary, you know, to try, to try to, this is a lost person, and I want her, it's an unchurched person, I want her a part of the church, and I want her, her daughter a part of the church. 
But when I said, well, you just come three Sundays, she said, I'm looking for a place that's not that pushy. Which I was so thankful for her honesty. And I thought to myself, pushy? God requires so much more than three Sundays. He requires your everything. Time, talent, treasure, heart, life. Count the cost. More than 52 Sundays isn't enough. It's your life God wants. What a disservice I need to repent of to to invite people into a, a simple walk, a simple commitment. It's not. It's more important than marriage, the commitment you make to Christ. And it happens at the altar just like marriage, right? When I married my wife, I didn't say, you know, I'll see you three Sundays. (laughs) You know, I was saying, I will give you everything. This is forever. It's my life. Why should church membership be anything different? Then it's got to be greater than that commitment that you make to your wife, doesn't it? I surrender everything. So now I know there's some in the church that are waiting to join. You should have came last year. (laughs) Actually, it's better that you didn't. Because now I get it. And if you want to know the requirements for membership, I'm going to tell you. Discipleship. Discipleship. Because Hilltop is going to be full of disciples, not members. Okay, we're called to fish for people, not to keep care of the aquarium. God wants you your whole life. He wants surrender. All of you. That's the recap, okay? The rest will be a little bit shorter. I want, the third point I want to make about the church, I want to begin by illustrating with this video. Can you play that video, Jeff? makes a powerful point, a very simple video makes a very powerful point of what church could look like and maybe what church was intended to look like. And there's, when we talk, when we first opened this, uh, this uh, discussion on why church, we started with Matthew 16 and we remember that there's an outward component that when Jesus, Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for on this rock I will build my church. He continues it, he continues it with another verse. He says, And the gates of hell will not prevail. 
that once the assembled people of God come together, that even hell will not be able to withstand it. And people in this world are living in a living hell. And there's an outward component of the church to not to, not to stay in here and, and just be protected and just encourage one another and just sharpen one another, but to go out and knock down the gates of hell. We have that ability. We've been empowered to do so, to knock down the gates of hell. There's a satisfaction to that kind of kingdom building. I, wanna, I wanted to read a, a, a scripture today from, from John chapter 4. If you, you guys remember the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, the largest woman in the Bible, the woman of some area? Okay. <laughs> Tough crowd. So uh, the woman at the well, she, was, she had... She had <laughs> He said bad joke. Uh, uh, The woman at the well uh, had had five wives, uh, five husbands. She was she was continually uh, trying to find uh, worth in men, and was and she found herself destitute, alone, and had to come out and gather water when no one else was there to avoid condemnation and to, to avoid getting anyone unclean. And so Jesus in John chapter four goes out of his way to meet with this woman at the well. And he reveals things to her that she didn't even know about herself. And she offers him uh, more than the water that's in the well, but living water. He offers her, excuse me. And, and this is where we pick up. And I, and I want to re- start in verse 27 of chapter 4. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? And then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city, and she said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Verse 31. Listen to this part. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have no food to, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of my Father, of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. I just found it intriguing that here Jesus finishes up this awesome conversation with this this woman who so desperately was alone and and now is beginning to find life. And he finishes it all up and the disciples, when they meet him, they're a little bit concerned of what's he doing with this woman. She's ill repute. But then they say, you know, we got to eat, Jesus. You must be starving. And Jesus says, I'm stuffed. I'm full. And they're like, did somebody slip him a four beans casserole? Whatever, you, we're going to have it at our potluck today. Did someone give him something to eat? How could that be? He's been here all day. There's no way he could have eaten. He said, I am full because I am doing the will of my Father. And I thought about that how full the church could be if we engage in the will of God for us. How full we can be. You know, I, Alpha, the Alpha course is going on right now, and, uh, and we break up into small groups, and I, I'm just around. Like, I'm not supposed to be in the course, but I can't not go into the small groups and, and see what they're learning and studying and talking about. I've got to be there. And this week they went around the room and said, why are you here? And in both groups, when I snuck in and, and sat down, that question fell on me. Why are you here? And, 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 and I'm not even supposed to be there, right? And so I, but my answer is, this is my answer, because I'm so hungry. And I know I'm going to get full if I sit down here. I know I'm going to hear, see our church making disciples of others in our church. And that's just, that's so satisfying. There's nothing like bringing eternity to another human being. There's nothing, that, there's nothing like breaking loneliness or liberating another human being. There's just nothing like it. 
outward, the outward component outside of these walls are where we really get fed. You know, some of us come here to get fed on Sundays. Our food comes from doing the will of the Father, not from listening to the will of the Father, right? It comes from doing the will of the Father. Man, we don't even need a potluck today. We'll just be so full in the way that Christ is full. A person in our church has been visiting our church uh, sent me this response to, in Facebook when a few weeks ago when I asked the question, why church? Give me your answer. They didn't want to put it on my wall, so they sent me a private message, and I asked this person if I could share it. I'm not going to reveal their name, but this is what they said. Why church? I'm not sure what I believe right now, but I started thinking about attending several months before I did. A voice was repeating in my head, go to church, it will be Okay. Just step in the door. It will be okay. But what convinced me to step in the door was the day before I did, I was really, really, it was a really, really tough day. And when, when that voice started going in my head, I realized church offers community. It's a herd. And something to look forward to every week. I don't want to be alone in the world anymore. And though I have not taken advantage of what your church has to offer in that regard, There is a lot of opportunities, and I love everybody I've met so far. Way to go. Way to go. I still don't know what I believe, or at least I don't want to admit what the voice was or why when I walked in, though I was late and I didn't actually sit in a pew, I walked in just in time to hear your sermon on loving, and I started to cry, and not lightly. I wanted really badly to lay down on the ground, but I leaned against the wall crying, Listen to, and listen to the rest of the service in the hallway. Afterwards, I felt amazing, and I said I would come back next week. I don't know what I believe about church, but I think I'm beginning to understand. I'm stuffed. Are you guys full? Doing the will of our Father? Leading a lonely person to Jesus? A lonely person who definitely so desperately needs living water. I remember at uh, Sharon Turtle's funeral, Richard, who's saying, uh, Jesus loves me today, you, he's got a speech impediment. He knows it's not something that we all don't know about. He's had it since he was a child. And when he met Sharon, what a perfect union. Because she could speak on his behalf. And she did. She speak, she, he, this was Richard's most uh, famous gesture. You tell them, Sharon. (laughs) Right? And they complimented one another. And I spoke about that in the funeral service. And when the the message was over, Richard was sitting right here in the front row, and he said this. He stammered through it, and he said this. Now who will speak for me, Pastor Fred? And I said, I will. And then I took it back. I said, no, we will. Because we're a tribe. We're a flamboyance. We're a pack. We're a crash. We're together. We're doing life together. This is church, people. And sometimes it hurts when the tools, the knives sharpen each other. Sometimes it hurts, but it's always to make us who God wants us to be. And it's always so that the world will see His light in us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to be your church. We don't want to be a people of just individual members here. We all want to give ourselves in complete surrender and discipleship to you. Lord, so that when the world sees us, and they will see us because we'll be out there, they will see that you have living water, that you offer a partner to their loneliness. God, help us be your church. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Christ for the World We Sing, number 568.